This is a really fun sculpture project because students have the opportunity to work reductively. If you think about clay, clay is really mushy. You can always add more clay or you can take the clay away. It's super flexible. This is different because you're starting with a block of wood and you're taking a knife and you're carving away. So you can't add to this, you can just remove. How does working reductively change your mindset? Well, it's different because first of all, it's a rigid material because if I carve something that maybe hangs over, I don't have to worry about it falling off. Whereas if I have clay and I put something that comes out, it's probably gonna fall off because it's so mushy. So there's a lot of things you can do with the structure of the sculpture that's a lot more flexible. How are students choosing what form to make? Well, it's funny because I'm such a planner. Most of the time when I have a drawing project, I'm really into thumbnail sketches and really knowing what you're doing in advance. This is such a different project because we don't plan at all. I literally just give them the hunk of wood and I say, just start carving. Because I just find with this particular technique, it's challenging enough to work reductively. And I think sometimes students draw these really intricate pencil sketches and then they feel really frustrated when they can't reproduce that sketch in the balsa wood. And I just find it's really an engagement with the balsa wood, that you just see what the balsa wood can do instead of trying to get the balsa wood to behave in a way that's unnatural. The students really like that. And it's also a nice surprise. Like you just don't know what's gonna happen. I'm noticing that all your examples are really rounded. Like there's no sharp edges. Why, why is that? The balsa wood sands really well. So you can just get these gorgeous surfaces. For example, this is one that has been carved, but it hasn't been sanded. And if you look at the cuts, they're really messy looking. Like it's really hard to make a clean cut mm -hmm. that looks, I mean, I think it's pretty much impossible. And so if you make a rounded form and you sand it, you get these beautiful soft surfaces. So to me, the organic form really shows the talents that the balsa wood has. One thing I like to do with students is whenever we work with a new material, especially in sculpture, I say to them, make friends with your sculpture, make friends with the material, like don't fight it, don't try to make it do something it doesn't wanna do. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I'm trying to do here. I'm saying, well, what is the balsa wood really good at and how can I exploit those qualities? So here we have four different stages of the project. I think if you're gonna teach this in a classroom situation, this is a really important visual to show the students because when you give them a hunk of wood, how are you supposed to visualize anything mm -hmm. out of this? So this is the beginning, which is just a piece of balsa wood. This is where you can see the edges and the corners have been removed, which is the first stage. You have to just get rid of all those edges and corners. And then this is one where you're starting to shave more specifically, you're starting to build out the form. And then this is a piece which has been sanded. So there are multiple stages and I think it's important for the students to feel that they're making progress because I think the leap from this to this is the most difficult to make because just the initial shaving, it takes a while. And so what I found with this project is students will work on it for a while and they feel like nothing's happening and then they'll get here and it looks great all of a sudden. <laughs> So you have to really egg on the students in the beginning. You have to really convince them that it's worth doing this because it pays off in the end. What if you're working with a really big class? Like having a lot of blades around sounds like it could get kind of dangerous. Is there anything safety-wise you should keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, one thing you can buy is Kevlar gloves. And these are really good because they'll protect your hand from little nicks. I mean, you don't want to be really irresponsible with it and be very deliberate, but if you put it on your left hand like this and say you're cutting, if you just get a little bit like this, it's gonna protect your hand. So to me, the Kevlar glove, it's like peace of mind as a teacher, because if you have 20 students, you can't hover over everybody. You have to trust that they're gonna be okay for the most part. I mean, I give them a big safety lecture. Like I explain how sharp the knives are and don't be irresponsible and don't point it at anybody, stuff like that. But the Kevlar glove really, really helps. There are a lot of different kinds of knives out there. Is there one in particular you use for this project? I really like these knives that have a retractable blade on them because you can control how long the blade comes out. Mm -hmm. And also these are really easy to sharpen. What you do is you take the knife, you unscrew it, 
and you push it up to the length that you want it. You don't want it like all the way out like that. That's not going to help you. Mm -hmm. And also, you don't want it so short that you can't cut anything. So if you look at these blades, you see how they're separated into these segments. So I usually push it up so there's two segments that are um, exposed, and then I just tighten it like this. To sharpen them, you have two different options. If you have a pair of pliers, you can just take the pliers like this and just snap it off, which is really easy. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure with these little blades here that you don't just toss them in the trash can because this can cut somebody who's picking up the bag. And so I just take paper and I wrap it up with tape and so that way it's not injuring anybody. But some of these knives actually have this black part and you can just push this part like this and it comes off. I take the black piece and I just slide the blade in like this and you just snap it off. Do you buy the blocks this size? No, I actually had these cut. So when I bought these, this was actually a very tall piece of balsa wood. This is huge. Like you wouldn't want to give this to a student because it would just take forever and ever for them to do. I think if I have a large class, I would just do the smaller one. I mean, it takes long enough as it is. And if it's too big, the students get super frustrated. Would you begin with any visual references or do you just have them go for it? Definitely visual references because the fact that I'm asking them to just work on it spontaneously, you gotta have something that you're thinking about. So what do you think would be good? to use as a reference. I see coral. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. see even gourd-like forms or even some succulents. Definitely. I mean, I have the students look at nature mm -hmm. and I also show them very specific artists like Jean Arp is a good artist, Henry Moore. I think Brancusi is really excellent. So I think the combination of showing them artists who work with organic sculptures and then images from nature, that's very rich and broad. And it really gives them some thinking about, well, what kind of forms could I make? You have to remove all of these hard edges and all of these corners. That's a given. No matter mm -hmm. what type of form you want to do, you have to do that first. You try to carve down as much as you possibly can, and that you never carve towards yourself. And if you want to carve across, that you carve this way. You take the knife and you just cut down like this. You don't want to cut up here. This is too high. So if I want to cut this, I'm going to flip it around and cut like this. Okay, so you're really starting towards the middle bottom. Yes, so middle bottom and down. And then if I want to do more, I come in like this. You have to press hard, but not too hard. I always say to the students, if this is incredibly hard to do, you're probably holding the knife wrong because if you are holding the knife correctly, it shouldn't be excessively difficult. It's like you're cutting like a vegetable or something. It is. I actually had a student who was like, it's just like carving an apple. I was like, yep. Now, why is it so important to take off all the edges and corners? Well, I mean, if you're gonna do an organic piece like this, I mean, do you see any corners or edges on this? Mm -mm. And so what I feel about sculpture is if you know you are definitely not gonna need it, then why even bother leaving it there? You might as well just clear it out. You don't wanna to try to take off too much at a time. Sometimes I have students, they start up here and they wanna cut off some gigantic hunk. That's actually very hard. It's easier to just do a lot of thin cuts. Mm -hmm. So you make more cuts, but it's easier because every cut you do is not so difficult. Do you notice how down here, I'm starting to cut at a more dramatic angle? Yeah. Sometimes in the beginning, you're just cutting down like this, but now I'm actually gonna cut at a diagonal okay. like this so I can start to really round yeah, off the I bottom. Because if I just cut straight, I'm just gonna end up with a very blocky, form. So now I'm making shorter cuts and I'm cutting at a more severe angle. You want to carve with the grain of the wood. Mm -hmm. Do you see how the grain is going up and down here? Mm. For example, if I was carving this block, I wouldn't want to hold it this way and carve down this way. Because if I try to carve against the grain, this is so oh. much harder. Like this, I really have to press because I'm going against the grain. Yeah. But because this is going with the grain, it's so much easier to do. A V-cut is when you cut into the wood. So you cut this way and then you cut this way. And so this allows you to get a shape like this, which goes into the balsa wood. You want to go on the edge 
and you cut down a little bit so you don't cut all the way through. Mm -hmm. And then you flip it around and then you cut it like this. And you can see how this just popped off. Yeah. Sometimes that's the grain of the wood you that does that. Little triangle. Yeah, and so sometimes mm -hmm. the grain of the wood doesn't um, cooperate, which uh -huh. is why with a V cut, you just take off a little bit at a time. Like it's okay. just a little shaving. It's the angle that's really hard for the students because you have to press hard and you also have to cut at an angle, which is harder. Uh -huh. Like if I cut down, it's easy, but cutting across like this is a lot harder. So if you look at the V cut, now I have this plane and I have this plane and you can go pretty deep. If you take your blade and you put your thumb here, this gives you more control okay. and you can start to do this type of action. So for this, I might wanna carve in like this and I can actually round it off like if I wanna carve oh. upwards like that and that will make it deep. You can make a V cut that maybe cuts across like this. And so you just take the knife and you press down and it's like you just pick it up like this. Oh. And so again, with your thumb here, and then you can flip it around and pick up the other side like that. So if I wanna make, and don't worry about these pieces that just come off because eventually you're gonna shave off a lot and so it doesn't really matter. So now I'm making like a line. So this is a V cut, but it's a very shallow V cut. You see how this V cut is very large and wide? This is like a line that's yeah. a V cut. And then I can make it wider. So if I wanna take off more, I can do something like this. Or I can carve this towards myself and make this wider. Every piece of balsa wood is different. Mm -hmm. I once had this piece, it was so light. I couldn't believe that it was so similar to styrofoam. This one was actually easier to carve because the balsa wood was a little bit harder, so it was mm. a lot more rigid. Uh -huh. The one that was super soft drove me crazy because it just kept flaking off and it was cutting in a funny way. Are there other types of woods you could maybe do this project with? I don't think I would try any other kind of wood in a class mm -hmm. because I think if you get regular wood, First of all, the tools are expensive because you need a lot. This is just this and some sandpaper. That's pretty much it. I sometimes buy some little files, but those are cheap. I mean, you can buy a huge set for very little. Um, but so it's the simplicity of the tools. And also balsa wood's not that expensive either. Like you can get a piece that you cut into three and it costs like $3 a student. So it's not that bad. And if you cut these even smaller, it's even cheaper. Mm -hmm. So you could make something that's really small and costs even less. What age group do you recommend for this project? I definitely would not go lower than 10th grade because okay. of the strength that it requires. Mm -hmm. I don't think that a sixth grader would have the physical strength to mm -hmm. do this. I think even 10th grade, it might be hard for them to stick with the project. So I think the ideal age is probably 11th grade and up would be fine. And college would be great too. And you can make this project more complicated. Like if you wanna make it bigger, if you wanna ask that the form is more complex. If you look at this form, it's a pretty simple form. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hole in the middle makes it a little bit complicated, but say compare this to one like this, this one's much more intricate, it took like double the amount of time. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to make the project more advanced or more simple. This is the point in the project where your piece just looks really crappy. <laughs> well, I mean, look at how coarse this is. It, yeah. it just does not look good. But mm -hmm. you have to remind the students that that's the way it has to be and that nobody starts with a beautiful sculpture mm -hmm. in the beginning. So do you see how I've divided this up mm -hmm. into three forms? So I have an angle this way and an angle this way. And then maybe on the other side, I'll start to do something similar and I, I'm just making this up. I just say, okay, I think I'll try this. When you let the students work spontaneously, it's like they have more fun with the supply. You don't feel like you have to control the material. You feel like you can just go with what the material wants to do. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I'll carve something and then something like this, like this just popped off, but I'm okay with it because mm -hmm. I didn't plan to have that piece there. Yeah. It's totally cool. Yeah, you don't want a dull blade. A dull blade is the worst. Yeah, <laughs> having a new clean blade is, makes all the difference with this. Well, sometimes when I'm teaching a class, I just try everybody's knife 
because mm. sometimes students don't even know that yeah. they have a dull blade. And so I feel a dull blade can actually be dangerous. It can, and, and it makes the students super frustrated. So I always check their blade. If they tell me, oh, I'm having so much trouble, I try their blade out, and then we can tell if it's the way they're holding it or if it's the actual blade that's the problem. If you remove too much of the bottom, it's gonna just stand over. I made that issue with this one because I wanted it to stand, but it doesn't stand. Like it has to be like this. Yeah. So you have to be very conscious if you want it to stand okay. up. You may not want it to stand out. You may want it to just be like this one, but it's up to you. But sometimes I look at the shape of the base and that just gives me an idea for how deep I can make the cuts. Like here, I'm probably gonna actually cut a little bit deeper. So it's good every now and then to look at the shape of your base just to see if it's getting more dramatic. Okay. When you have a class, it's a really good idea to have replacement blades, especially a big class. You just don't know how quickly they're gonna go through them. So what you wanna do is put the blade back in like this so you don't cut yourself. And then you take this black part, pop it off. You're going to unscrew this so that it comes all the way out like that. And now you're gonna take this blade off and again, wrap it with a piece of paper so that it doesn't go in the garbage like that, very gently put the black circle underneath this circle like this. And then you're gonna take the blade, push it back up, put this in to fight with it, it's not in the right place. Okay, unscrew that a little bit more. Okay, pull that out, screw this back in, and then you're gonna add this. And now you have your replacement blade. I'm at this point now where I've done enough V cuts that the V cuts are pretty deep. Yeah. The deeper they are, the more dramatic they look. And one thing that's really fun is you can cut a hole. The thing about a hole though, is you have to be careful because the balsa wood is strong, but it's not that strong. And so if you do carve a hole, you do have to be very careful about it. So right here, you can see this is pretty deep and this is pretty deep. So this is probably where I'm gonna be able to get a hole. This is even more like picking. It's not really cutting, it's just picking and gouging out. And so this takes a little while, but it's so fun when you actually get it to work out because I just think it makes the form a little bit more complex. And so once you break through to the other side, it gets easier because now it can cut around the hole like this. And again, you're, you're still picking, you're not really yeah. cutting. You can see I have the hole. I have really deep V cuts. You see these flat planes yeah. that are on it? You wanna get rid of those yeah, I don't really like because those. this makes it look really blocky. This is the really fun part because now you get to get rid of these flat planes. You can round off some of the edges. So it's very easy to just go in and just round this off. Like this is a really ugly flat edge. And now I'm gonna just make everything round. So do you see how that's getting more bulbous looking? Yeah. Like it doesn't look so much like a block. I tell the students that what you wanna do is get your sculpture to a point where you can't tell it was ever a block. Yeah. Because if it looks really blocky, if it's like in the shape of a square, yeah. it just doesn't look as good. Noticing now that this part of my sculpture it's getting really thin uh -huh. and I don't think this is gonna make it. <laughs> I think it's gonna totally fall off. Uh -huh. So when I have pieces like that, I don't try to fight it. I okay. just know it's gonna fall off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna cut through it. I have to be careful though, cause I don't wanna snap my piece in half. Yeah, totally. Isn't it weird looking? <laughs> the other thing you have to think about is the top because the top can't stay flat like this. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is come in and round these edges like this, and that way you don't have a flat top. You'll notice that my shape is starting to get really thin. You can't be as aggressive when you get to this point. Okay. Like, you know, in the beginning I was just hacking away yeah. and it was fine. Now I have to be gentle with it. Oftentimes students don't realize that you can start sanding a lot earlier than you think because I have this sanding screen and this is really strong. Like you really can remove a lot of the balsa. I've carved quite a bit. Part of me wants to carve a little more. Do you think I'm done? I, th I think there's not gonna be anything left if you yeah. keep going. So I'd say next step. This is the super fun, easy part that looks awesome.
You start with the screen, which is actually very rough and can remove a lot of balsa wood. Then okay. I use a very coarse sandpaper, a medium coarse one, and then a very fine one. So this, this incrementally makes the sandpaper smoother and smoother. So eventually you end up with something, honestly, is like feels like it's as soft as like a baby's belly or something. I always cut the pieces really small. I mean, you don't want to sand with this. This thing's yeah. gigantic. The important thing is that you put pressure on this. Sometimes I see students and they're doing this, which doesn't work very well. So you really have to have your thumb behind it and you press down with your thumb. And it's also good to go in different directions. So I might shave this way, turn it and shave this way. I just do a, a wipe over the entire thing. Why did you start with this one? Well, because this one's really coarse and it's gonna mm -hmm. take off a lot of balsa wood. Like if I start, with the really thin sandpaper, it's gonna take off so little. It just would take me forever to sand it. Whereas this one removes a lot very okay. quickly. And how do you tell which one's the, the thinner sandpaper? Well, they usually have a number for the grit. Mm -hmm. So the higher the grit, the thinner the sandpaper. Okay. So I think this one's like 350 grit, which is very high. So that mm -hmm. means it's very fine. Okay. I mean, I just go and I touch them <laughs> and that works out fine. I yeah. mean, I personally, I don't really care what the number is. I just want to see what it feels like. Oftentimes you'll find that there are parts of your sculpture that are hard to get to. For example, if I sand here, this is no problem, super easy to do, but this spot in the middle, you can't really do that. It's yeah. very awkward. One thing you can do is take the sandpaper and just roll it around a pencil like this. But you have to make sure it's the medium grit one because if I try to do that with the screen, it wouldn't work because it's too rigid. And even I found the coarse sandpaper was a little bit too coarse. And then you just take it and the nice round edge of the pencil lets you move in that area and then you can really sand it smooth. I might take the sandpaper and fold it in half and sometimes you can do more of this kind of motion if you have something that's really, really thin. So there's the finished product. After all that cutting and sanding, we went from this over to this. That's amazing. I would have never expected that you could get something so dynamic and so volumetric, like out of a block like right. this. And so easily, really. Mm -hmm. And the other nice thing I like about this is this is a permanent material. Yeah. It's not like plaster, which you'd have to get cast. It's not like air dry clay, mm -hmm. which breaks really easily. So there's definitely a permanence to this material that's fantastic. MoMA. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> no, they actually come a lot bigger. Usually they're right. Bleh. Okay, do it again. <laughs> do you remember like the first Harry Potter movies? His acting was like, Stiff. really bad. Yeah, it was really bad. It was so bad.